How many of you recognize the quote hidden behind the title of the talk? Raise your hand if you recognize a quote embedded in the title. Now we'll get to that. Consider an even number, 2n people, seated around a circular table. For example, if n is equal to 3, 6 people are seated like that. How many ways are there for them to form n pairs of simultaneous handshakes with no two handshakes crossing each other? Okay? This is not allowed. They cannot cross hands over each other. And this is also not allowed. On either side of a handshake, there should be an even number of people left. That person over there has no one to shake hands with. This is allowed. There are no crossings among the handshakes. How many ways are there when n is equal to 3? That's not the only way. Careful, how many configurations can you build? Yes? Um, not sure if you can find six. Yes? Five. Yes. These are the five configurations. When you play a little bit, when you draw it on paper, you see that these are all the configurations. What is the answer for any value of n? That's what we are interested in. Well, if n is equal to one, it's very easy. You have only one way. When n is equal to two, you have two ways. And when n is equal to 3, you compute it five ways. By h1, h2, h3, and so on, we'll denote the answer to this problem, h coming from handshakes. OK, what is the answer when n is equal to 4? You don't want to just list and draw all the configurations. You may make a mistake. And also, we want to find some general method that will help us when n is larger. So let's do it more systematically. Let's single out one of the people, this green dot represented by the green dot, and think about who that person might, might shake hands with. This is one case. That person shakes hands with the person immediately to their right on the table. Well, how many ways are there to complete that picture? You have six more people. They have to form three more pairs of handshakes. They shouldn't cross each other, but there is no way that any of their handshakes crosses the already existing handshake. So how many ways are there to complete this configuration? You have three pairs left. They have to cross. They have to uh, form three handshakes with no crossings. Five. This is what we already determined. You have three pairs or six people, and they can uh, form three pairs of uh, handshakes with no crossings in five different ways. This was on the previous slide. OK, so there are five ways to finish. And the reason is that this handshake doesn't conflict with anything. Second case is when this person in green shakes hands with that one there. Remember, on either side of a handshake, there should be an even number of people. OK, how many ways are there to complete that picture? At the end, there should be four pairs of handshakes, yes? Two. two. OK, so these two must shake hands. There is no, ch no choice for them. And you have four people. They can, uh, they can form two pairs in two different ways. Excellent. Next case is when the green one shakes hands here. This is symmetric to the earlier case. Namely, those two have to shake hands. And those four you can do in two ways. Notice that the ones on, the, on one side of the handshake and on the other, they form completely independent groups. They cannot shake hands with each other because that would cross the existing handshake. And finally here, how many ways are there to finish? Yes? Again, five. The same as the answer when n is equal to three. Altogether, when you add these up, you get 14. And this is our next entry in the table. Do you see a pattern? Not yet. It's difficult to see. Yes? Uh, n mi minus 1 squared plus n minus 2 squared. OK, let's compute the next entry, and then we'll see if this formula uh, will hold. OK, what happens when you have five pairs? You need to form five pairs of handshakes. You have now 10 people. Again, look at this green person. In that case, how many ways are there to finish? Yes? 14, because those 
four pairs have to form four uh, handshakes without crossings, and the existing handshake doesn't conflict with anything. There are 14 ways. If, if that green one shakes hands as indicated, then those two have to shake hands. They have no choice. And you're left with six people. Six people can form three pairs of handshakes in, yes, in five ways. So here you have five ways to finish. In that case, you have four on one side, four on the other side, yes? So two ways to finish on one of the sides, and total, four, two times two. So two on one side, two on the other side. If you continue, here there will be five ways to finish, those two shake hands and five ways more to finish. And finally, when the green one shakes hands with the person immediately on their left, there are 14 ways to finish. When you add these up, you get 42. Is anyone here familiar with the legacy of the number 42? Some of you, okay. So 42 is our next entry in the table. Now, just for convenience, as a matter of convention, when n is zero, when you have no people, when you have to form no pairs, let's agree that the answer is one. There is one way for them, that is to say, no one shakes hands with anyone else. This is a convention, it will be useful later. All right, now let's move to n equals six. Does your formula hold so far? So we'll see, we'll find, we have to find a formula. Let's compute some more entries and then hope to find some formula. When n is equal to six, we do the same. Just uh, now it will be easier. If the green one shakes hands as indicated, there are zero pairs on one side and five pairs on the other side. How many ways are there to finish? Well, we can say one times 42. One way to finish to the top of that handshake, that is to say you don't do anything there, and 42 ways for the remaining five pairs below the handshake. Next, if the handshake is as indicated, there is one pair on one side and four pairs on the other side. In this case, there is one way to complete it on the top left and 14 ways to complete it on the bottom right, one times 14. Next, if they shake hands further down, there are two pairs on one side, on the right side of the handshake coming from the green, and three pairs on the other side. How many ways are there to complete that? Yes? Two times five, very good. Two from there and five from there. Notice we multiply two numbers in the table. Next. Next, it's symmetric. Three on the right and two on the left side will be five times two. Again, we multiply five times two from the table. And then over there, it will be 14 times one. 14 on one side, one on the other side. And finally, 42 times one, altogether 132. This is our next entry in the table. Now, what is the pattern? From here, having completed the table so far, we can keep going. We can build the whole. Ta we can keep building the table. You can see a formula. If you like to write down a formula, this is the formula for each value of h in terms of all the previous values. If we have computed h n for n from one up to six, very easily we can compute h seven from that formula. Namely. Let's say you want to do H7, you have to multiply 1 times 132, the, very, the entry at the very beginning times the last computed entry so far. Then, so it's always sum of products. The products, the first factor you move right and the second factor you move left. The next one will be 1 times 42, next you go 2 times 14, then you go 5 times 5. This corresponds to the case when you have 5 pairs on one side, five pairs on the other side of the handshake. And then 14 times two, you keep going right with the first factor and left with the second factor, 132 times one, altogether 429. Have a question for you. Have we solved the problem about the handshakes? Have we figured out the number of handshakes, the number of configurations of handshakes? If I give you a value of n, well, this tells you how to compute the number of handshakes. For 7, you got 429, and you can keep going. If you have built the table up to a certain point, you can find the next entry, and so on and so on. If I tell you n is 27, you can build the table up to 27. 
How many of you think, yes, we have solved the problem? We have determined the number of handshake configurations. No? You think, yes, in a certain sense, we have solved the problem. We found a recursive, this is called a recursive formula. It expresses the number of configurations in terms of smaller configurations. How many of you think, no, we have not completely solved the problem? Right, you can argue that we have not given a closed formula. We have not given a simple, easy formula for the number of handshake configurations. If I tell you n is 27, you need to be able to plug in 27 in some formula and output an answer without having to compute all the other 26 entries in the table. There should be a direct formula. We call it a closed formula. Okay, we'll get there, but now surprisingly, rather than launch into uh, finding such a formula, we consider a second problem. So we move to a second problem. A jar is initially empty. Every day, you can either put a coin in it, or if there are some coins in the jar, you can take a coin out. You choose. In two end days, the jar is empty again. In order for the jar to be empty again, it takes an even number of days because whatever you put in, you have to take out. How many ways are there to do that? How many ways are there to have the jar empty again in two N days? Here is some example. With pluses, we indicate that we put a coin in. With minus, that we take a coin. Coin in, in, out, in, and the last two days, you take a coin out. This is allowed when n is equal to 3. You have to count sequences like that. This is not allowed. You cannot put a coin in, out, then in, and then take coins out in two consecutive days because you cannot take coins out of an empty jar. This is the one thing to remember. You cannot take coins out of an empty jar. Up to any certain point, there should be at least as many pluses as minuses. You cannot have more minuses than pluses. All right, now what is the answer to that question? Let's figure out the answer when n is small and then try to build a general answer. When n is equal to 1, you have two days. How many ways are there? Yes? One. Very good. Only you have to put a coin in and then you take it out the second day. When n is equal to 2, how many ways are there? Yes? Two. Either in, in, out, out or in, out, in, out. What about when n is equal to 3? You have to write. You can write on your hand or on your paper. You have to count it. Or you can do it mentally, but it's easier if you write. Yes? Five. That's right, these are all the five. One, two, three, four. Oh no, I'm missing one. Okay, five. There are five, you're right. Here on the screen you see four, uh, but uh, we're missing one. There are five, and when n is equal to four, you can count 14. These are the numbers that we saw in the problem with the handshakes. Now, the question is what happens for larger values of n? Let's see when n is equal to five. It would be more difficult. Now you have a string of 10 symbols, 5 pluses, 5 minuses. Let's investigate that. It's hard to draw them systematically. So here is an idea. Well, again, let's, say, let's agree that when n is equal to 0, the answer is 1. Now I use jn, j coming from jar. This is the problem with the jar. Look at the first minus that makes the jar empty again the first instant when the jar is empty. There has to be such a minus, because at the end, the jar is empty again. What is the first time when the jar is empty? Well, you start with a plus. You have to start with a plus. Then there is some stuff, pluses, minuses. And then here is the first minus that makes the jar empty again. And after that, there is again some string of pluses and minuses. OK n is equal to 5, so total you have 10 days, 10 symbols. What can you say about box 1 and box 2? What do you know about box 1, which happens between the first plus 
and the first minus that makes the jar empty again. And what happens in box two, which is after the jar is empty again, yes? They have to be, total they need to have eight symbols. Yes, very good, so total they have eight symbols. What else can you say about the first and the second box? Yes? Very good. The total number of the output of box one has to be zero. So box one must contain as many pluses as minuses. And what about box two? As well, box two must contain as many pluses and minuses. Box one contains as many pluses and minuses as minuses because after that other minus, you are left with no coins. And then, because at the very end you are left with no coins, same is true for box two. Okay, so each of them has the same number of pluses and minuses. What else can you say about box one and box two? Can they have any um, string of pluses and minuses as long as there are as many pluses as minuses? Yes? Right, in box one you cannot have two minuses. In fact, is it possible that box one starts with a minus? Yes? Yes or no? Very good, because then the first minus would happen in box one. But the first minus that makes the jar empty again is that minus between box one and box two. Therefore, box one cannot start with a minus. It must start with a plus. Very good. What else can you say about box one and box two? Yes? Box two cannot start with a minus. That's true, because at the beginning of box two you have an empty jar. You have to start with a plus. Yes? Box two will end with a minus. Very good, yes, because you start with an empty jar and then you do stuff and then you finish with an empty jar, yes? Box one also finishes with a minus, absolutely correct. Because um, uh, it has to finish with a minus. Why? Why does it finish with a minus? Yes? Very good. If box one finished with a plus, then at some point there would be more minuses than pluses in box one. Therefore, at some point there will be one more minus than pluses in box one. And combined with the plus at the beginning, at some point in box one, you would have as many pluses as minuses. The jar would be empty again sometime in box one and not in that minus between box one and box two. Excellent. What else can you say about box one and box two? Total, they have eight symbols. Box one could have no symbols. Then box two would have eight. Box one could have... Uh, one symbol, uh, two symbols, then box two would have six, and so on. But what about the sequence of pluses and minuses in each of the two boxes? All you're saying is correct. Let's build up an observation from that. Yes? Mm, if not sure, because what if box two, for example, has a lot of, uh, has eight uh, symbols in it. You may have many ways to put a sequence of four pluses, four minuses in box two. Yes? Very good. Box one and box two, they are solutions to the same problem. Each of them has as many pluses as minuses. So if you just look at one of the two boxes, uh, it's filling up a jar and then having the jar empty on the last day. At no point can have box two more minuses than pluses, because beginning of box two you start with an empty jar, and then you cannot put a couple of pluses and then more minuses, because then it means you're taking uh, coins out of an empty jar. Box one, the same thing. You cannot have more minuses than pluses at any point, up to any point, because then at some point you'll have one minus more than the number of pluses, and combined with the plus at the beginning, 
box, uh, the jar would be empty sometime earlier, not at the instant where we have indicated with this minus between box 1 and box 2. Therefore, they are solutions to the same problem, but for smaller values of n. Okay, there are the possibilities. Box 1 may have two, uh, by the way, each of them has an even number, obviously, of uh, symbols, because the total net qual quantity is zero. So these are the possibilities. And now, in each case, when n is zero, when box 1 is empty, and box 2 corresponds to n equals 4, you have 1 times 14 possibilities for box 2. In the case, let's say, when each of them cor has four symbols, box 1 corresponds to the same problem with n equals 2, box 2 also corresponds to the problem with n equals 2, you have 2 times 2. All together, when you add them up, 42. Again, you get the same 42. Not just you get that you get the same numbers, but you get the same formula for filling out the table. If you were to compute the next entry in the table, you have to do the same thing with the existing numbers. You have to put them together in the same way as we did in the problem with the handshakes. It's exactly the same recursive relation and exactly the same initial values. Therefore, th the problem with the jar has the same answer as the problem with the handshakes. Whatever that answer is, we haven't found it. We just moved to a different problem. We still have to find it. But it has exactly the same answer because we got exactly the same formula. Now, rather than solve the problem right now, I will do something surprising again. I will jump to a third problem. Now we consider yet another problem. Consider a grid and then consider paths from 0, 0 to n, n that consist of steps north, that is to say going one unit up, or east, going one unit right. How many paths are there from the origin to NN that consist of step no steps north or east and never go above the diagonal? They can hit the diagonal but should not go above the diagonal. For example, a path like that. It hits the diagonal here, it never goes above the diagonal. Here is another path. Of course, it starts on the diagonal, ends on the diagonal, shouldn't go above. This is another example. It can hit the diagonal many times. I don't care as long as it doesn't go above. How many such paths are there? Well, this is again a difficult problem. What you can do, by the way, just to analyze, you can encode this path. Let's say you have to tell your friend which path we have drawn on the screen. You don't want to draw the whole picture. It takes too much space. You can encode it east, east, and then twice north and then east, north, then twice east, north, east, and twice north. You can encode it with symbols east and north. From the encoding, you can draw the path. From the path, you can, draw, you can write down an encoding. Or to the east symbols, you can put pluses, and the n symbols, you can replace by minuses. What do you notice? Yes? Very good. Up to any point, you should have at least as many pluses as minuses. You should have at, at least as many easts as norths. Otherwise, if you have more norths than easts, you would jump above the diagonal. Like, for example, consider this encoded path. I haven't even drawn it yet, but if you look, if you prefer, you can write pluses and minuses. Up to here, up to that point, up to the first nine symbols, you have four Easts and five Ends. You have more Ends than Easts. This means you will go above the diagonal. If you draw it, you visually see that you go above the diagonal. That's because you have more Ends than Easts. What is the conclusion from this dictionary that we have on the board? On the left we have paths, on the right we have encodings. The encodings you can uh, represent with Easts and ends or pluses and minuses. What is the conclusion from that? Tell me something relevant about at the end you have to find the number of paths that do not go above the diagonal. What can you say about this number? Yes? Very good, exactly. It's exactly the same answer as in the jar problem because to find paths 
that never go above the diagonal is the same thing as finding sequences of pluses and minuses where up to any given point you have at least as many pluses and as minuses. By the way, that you finish at n n means that you have exactly n easts and n norths, as many pluses as minuses, and you never have more minuses than pluses. Okay, so up to now, we have discussed three problems and they have the same answer. H for handshakes, jars, and pots that never go above the diagonal. The same answer, the same table, we know how to compute, but what is this answer? Give me a formula for the answer. We have to find a formula for that answer. If you just care about, let's say, the handshakes problem, then we discuss two more problems that admit the same answer. Have we made progress? Conceptual question. Have we made any progress on one of these problems, on a fixed pro on your favorite of these three problems? How many of you think, yes, we have made progress by discussing these two other problems? No, no progress, just made some other, uh, came up with other problems. How many of you think, um, well, have we made progress or not? Yes? Very good, we understand the same problem in different ways. You can think of these as different facets of the same problem. It's like one problem, you look at it from one side, you see the handshakes, you look at it from another side, you see the jars, you look at it from a third side perspective, you see the pots. And what is the advantage of that? The advantage is that if we want to get to the bottom of this problem, if we really want to understand the problem, we can choose which of those three perspectives to take. One of them may have some advantage over the other two. So now we are free to choose which approach to pursue further. We're going to take the paths. So we will look in detail in the problem concerning paths that do not go above the diagonal. And this problem has a certain advantage over the other two uh, that will become transparent. Okay, how many northeast paths are there from A to B, from the origin to NN, that do not go above the diagonal? Difficult problem. Let's do something easy. What is the total number of paths? We are going to compute the total number of paths from A to B that only go north and east, right or up, and from them we will subtract the bad paths, the ones that do go above the diagonal. Yes? Very good, so you have to have six E's and six N's, that's for sure. Very good, so this is one example, so this is one path. I don't care about the diagonal at all, but you can see you have N, let's call it little N capital N's and little N capital E's, so as many of those as the others. Very good, if you think about the encoding or if you think about the path, doesn't matter, excellent. This is one example, here is another path. You encode it like that. It should have as many E's as N's. Each of them should be little n. This is a third example of a path. Again, a sequence of E's and N's. How many are there? What is a path? Now this is an easy problem, yes? Um, very, uh, let's think about pluses and minuses or n's and e's, but let's not think about the diagonal because having to stay below the diagonal makes it very, very difficult. Now we are just computing the total number of paths. I don't care about the diagonal, I just want to go from 0, 0 to n, n. What does it take to reach from 0, 0 to reach n, n? What do you have to choose? What kind of choice do you have to make? How can you enumerate all of these paths? How can you count them? A path is a sequence like that. This is one path, n, n, e, n, e, n, and so on. This is a second, this is a third. These are three examples of such paths. Of course, there are many more. How many are there total? Yes? Um, 49? Um, 7 times 7. No, 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 it will not be 49. Mm. 
Let's think about what a path is. A path is encoded as a sequence with little n symbols capital N and as many symbols capital E, yes? Uh, we have 14 or 2n options, yes? So, two, uh, well, you have to build a sequence of 2n symbols, yes? Very good. And from them? Very good. From these 14 or 2n symbols, n are going to be capital N's and the other n are going to be capital E's. Oh, excellent. So we have to choose the number of ways to choose 2n steps or 2n symbols of which n are E's and n are N's. Very good. And how many ways are there to do that? Pro accounting problem in combinatorics. Yes? Uh, factorial? Mm. Yes? 2n? Which one is it? Two to the power. Not two to the power of n, because if you do two to the power of n or two to the power of two n, then you would get sequences like e, 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 only e's. And you need to have n e's and n capital n's. Yes? Uh, n? Say, say a, louder, a little louder, please. N factorial squared. Um, no, it's not n factorial squared. The reason is that, one reason is that these n's are indistinguishable from each other. So you just have to put n symbols somewhere, n symbols capital N somewhere, and the other n symbols will be capital E. Yes? 2n choose n. Okay, so look, look at these sequences. I color the E's. If you tell me the position of the little n, the n E's, then you can determine where the nords fit. If you tell me that you have an E on positions 3, 5, 7, 8, 9, and the last two positions, then this determines a path. If you tell me five, you have to choose five positions, uh, you have to choose, in this case, seven positions out of the 14. If you choose which seven positions you're going to fill up with E's, then this determines the path. The other seven you put, in the other seven you put N's. Okay, so the answer is 2N choose N. Very good, this is the total number of paths, and you see it's very easy to count it. It's very easy, very elegant formula, 2N choose N, because that's what a path is. 2N symbols, once you choose the positions of the pluses or the Easts, then you ch the, the minuses or norths are determined uniquely. Okay, excellent. This, this is the total number of paths, but this was easy. It's easy to find the total number of paths. We have to find the paths that do not go above the diagonal. So now let's find the number of paths from A to B that do go above the diagonal, the bad paths. And then we'll subtract those from the total number and we'll be done. And this is the difficulty in the problem. We have to figure this out. This is very, very difficult. This is the crux of the matter. Yes? Mm, it's not quite divided by two. No, 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 no. It will not be divided by two. Um, so let's see. It's, let's see. To go above the diagonal means that it hits this green line. What is the equation of this line, by the way? If I, yes? Very good, y equals x plus one, we shift the diagonal one unit up. Now, how many northeast paths from A to B hit that line? So I can replace the condition go above the diagonal by saying hit the green line. I'm not going to be interested in the diagonal so much, I'll be interested if they hit the green line. 
Okay, how many paths hit the green line? Now we are in the heart of the problem. We have to figure this out. If we figure this out, we are finally done with the problem. But this is not easy. Not easy to find the paths that hit the green line. To do that, we look at this problem in geometry. I hope that you're familiar with it. You have a line and two points A and B on one side of the line. You have to go from A to B, the shortest possible way, but you have to first go to the line. So from A you go to the line and then to B. And then should be shortest possible. Which point on the line has the property that the distance from A to that point and then from that point to B is as small as possible? How many of you are familiar with this problem? Raise your hand if you're familiar. Some of you, but not all. Okay, it's nice that some of you are familiar. So what is the answer to that? What kind of point? Look, you, you're searching for some point on the line. You have to go to the line and then come back to B. You don't want to go directly to the line. That's the fastest way to reach the line, but then you take a longer way to B. You may look at something like this. Who knows where this point is? We have to figure it out, yes? Very good, where the entrance angle and the exit angle are equal. Very good, we'll, we'll prove this. We'll prove that this is exactly that point. How do you prove this? Yes? Excellent, you reflect the point B with respect to the line. You have to think outside of your half plane. A and B are in the same half plane of the line and all of your path will take place in that half plane, but now use, take advantage of the other half plane. Reflect the point B. So drop a perpendicular and then go twice that much, that distance on the other side. What is the advantage? Why do you reflect? Well, when you look at AX plus XB, that's what you're interested in, XB is equal to XB prime because B and B prime are reflections of each other and X is on the line. So instead of thinking of AX plus XB, now I can think of AX plus XB prime. So I have to go from A to B prime by stopping by on the line L. Of course, any path from A to B prime will hit the line L. Now the difference is that A and B prime are on opposite sides of the line. So no matter how you connect them, you, you intersect the line anyways. And now you have to find the point so that when you go from A to that line, to the point X, and then from X to B prime, it's the, the shortest possible path. Which point is that? Yes? Very good, the intersection. So this is smallest when X is the intersection of A, B prime and L. Th this is the fastest way, the shortest way from A to B prime altogether. And luckily, it passes through the line L. It, it intersects the line L. Luckily, because A and B prime are now on opposite sides of the line L, unlike the points A and B at the beginning. So you connect here, and this is the optimal position. This is the position so that when you connect it with B, the distance from A to X0 plus X0B is smallest possible. Does this sound familiar to you? A lot of you are familiar with this problem. Very important problem. It says that it's called the reflection law in optics. If you have a ray of light, the incidence angle is equal to the reflection angle. So these angles are equal, as you say. This is a, f a problem from physics. And that's how we think about it geometrically by reflecting one of the points. Okay, this tells us how to think about a path from one point to another point that has to stop by, that has to hit a certain line. Namely, we reflected one of the points. Now let's go back to our problem. Here is our problem. This was the hard part. We had to find the number of paths from A to B. Just the number of paths is, was easy. It was this binomial coefficient, 2n choose n. But now the paths that hit the green line. We have to count the paths that do hit the green line. This is difficult. This qualification there that hit the green line, this is what makes the problem difficult, very difficult. 
Okay, without this, just the paths, it's very easy to find, but you want to make sure that they hit the green line. Let's take the lesson from the previous geometry problem. What is the lesson? Think outside of your half plane. So let's reflect with respect to the green line. Let's respect, uh, reflect the point A. So I bring it to this point A prime, prolong the green segment a little bit, and then extend our grid a little bit on the left. You see here there is some mathematics going on. This is a difficult proof. It will be very short, but it requires this idea. It requires a creative idea. It's not just writing down a solution. It requires some substantial idea. What are the coordinates of A prime? What did we do for A prime? Yes? Minus 1, 1. We went one unit left and one unit up. This is the reflection of the point A. Okay, now why do we do this reflection? Because, just like the problem with the light, if we have any path from A to B which hits the green line, like that. Consider any path that hits the green line. If it hits the green line, there is some first instant when it hits the green line. So mark the point where it first hits the green line. And then look at the first section until that intersection point from A to that first point and reflect that with respect to the green line. In red you have the reflected image of this path. Reflect means you take the mirror image with respect to the line. A goes to A prime. Anytime you have east, a section east, horizontal, it becomes vertical. Anytime you have something vertical, it becomes horizontal. The point there on the green line stays where it is. So this is a path from A to that marked point. You reflect it, you get a path from A prime to the marked point. The first section of the path we reflect as we have shown. The second section we keep as it is. Just make it thicker. Now, from, well, we started with a path from A to B that hits the green line. To this path, by reflecting the first chunk of it, we obtained a path from A prime to B. We obtained a path from A prime to B, and I don't have to give any qualification for that path. I don't have to say that hits a certain line or that avoids a certain line. Just a path from A prime to B. And any path from A prime to B, conversely, will correspond to a path from A to B that hits the green line. Well, okay, look, the number of paths from A to B hitting the green line is equal to the number of paths, period, from A prime to B. Just paths from A prime to B with no qualification, with no further property, just paths going from A prime to B. They will correspond to paths from A to B that hit the green line. Okay? Paths from A prime to B would be very easy to count. And instead of this having this difficult condition that paths from A to B have to hit the green line, we replace it by paths from A prime to B. Why is it that every path from A prime to B corresponds to... Let's look at a path from A prime to B. Just a path. Nothing added as a qualification. Just a random path from A prime to B. Why does it correspond to a path from A to B that hits the green line? How does it correspond to? To which path from A to B hitting the green line does this one correspond to? Yes? Very good. Until it hits the green line, you reflect the first part and the second you keep. So you look at the first intersection point and the first chunk until it hits the green line. The green line. Then you reflect that and you keep the rest. So the rest you make thicker and the first, the red chunk, you reflect. So to the thick line, consisting of red and black, to the thick path, you associate the black path going from A to B, hitting the line L. Excellent. This is the main step of the problem. Instead of paths from A to B that hit the green line, you replace those by paths from A prime to B, just paths. 
How many are there? That's very easy. Now it's very easy. We have essentially solved the problem. This is the key step. This is the idea. To replace paths that hit the green line by paths instead from A prime to B. How many are there? That should be very easy. How do you count paths from A prime to B? In terms of N. It should be similar to what we did to count the total number of paths from A to B. Now, paths from A prime to B. By the way, before we even do that, I'll give you the floor in a moment. Are there fewer paths from A prime to B than there are from A to B? This is just to check. The, yes? Uh, no. Well, there are fewer paths from A prime to B because the paths from A prime to B, they correspond to paths from A to B that hit the green line. But you have further paths from A to B that do not hit the green line. Okay, so the paths from A prime to B are fewer than the paths from A to B. They correspond to the paths from A to B that do hit the green line. Okay, what are the paths from A prime to B? Let's, let's give a... Uh, a specific answer in terms of numbers, and then we'll check. We'll see that there are fewer. They have to be fewer. So what is it? How do we count? Yes? Um, n minus 1. OK, so let's see. You have to choose two n steps. From here, you have to choose n plus 1 horizontal and n minus 1 vertical. Before, it was n horizontal and vertical. Now it's n plus 1 horizontal and minus 1 vertical. Again, it's total 2n, but the number of horizontal and vertical ones differ. And how many ways are there to choose a path consisting of 2n steps, of which n plus 1 are horizontal and n minus 1 are vertical? Yes? Um, 2n, this is the total number of steps. And from these steps, you have to choose which ones are going to be horizontal and which ones are going to be vertical. You need to have n plus 1 horizontal and n minus 1 vertical. So what is then the answer? From 2n steps, a total of 2n steps, n minus 1 have to be vertical, and n plus 1 have to be horizontal. In how many ways can you choose that? You have to choose the positions of the easts, or the norths, equivalently. In how many ways can you do that? Yes? Very good. 2n choose n minus 1. The moment you choose the vertical ones, then the other ones will be horizontal in your string if you choose the positions for the vertical ones. So this is the answer. This is the number of paths that do hit the green line. It's equal to the number of paths from A prime to B. Now we are essentially done. Our number of paths, let's call it Pn, the total number of paths, minus the paths that do hit the green line. Or if you wish, minus the paths from A prime to B. The two numbers look very similar, but the first one is much bigger than the second. Now, if you want, you can work it out by factorials. 2n factorial divided by n factorial times n factorial and so on. You subtract, then you take the common factor, you have something in brackets, you simplify in the brackets, so you have that factor. The n you combine with n minus 1 factorial, and the 1 over n plus 1 you keep, and you get that formula. This is the number of paths from A to B that do not go above the diagonal. It's equal to the total number of paths minus the paths that do hit the green line. That is to say, minus the paths from A prime to B. And at the end, you get that very, very elegant formula. What is the conclusion? All these three problems, they have the same answer given by that very explicit, very compact formula. These numbers are called Catalan numbers. They're normally denoted by CN. Catalan numbers, and they solve all of these problems. They are the answer to everything. Well, if you want to compute C5, for example, 
you just plug in 1 over 6 and then the binomial 10 choose 5. You work it out, 10 choose 5 as a fraction, you cancel a lot and you get 42. Why is 42 uh, such a special number? Because of this quote from Douglas Adams, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The answer to the great question, the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything is, he says, apparently 42. Thank you.